Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your word we might embrace and ever hold fast your hope of everlasting life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The life of Jacob with Luther, and we are we're right at that moment where, where Jacob is now coming in to get the blessing from Isaac, and he's going to get it, and he leaves, and then Esau comes in and says, I'm ready for the blessing, and then huh, they realize what's happened. So um, we are in, I better share the screen here, we are in Genesis mm, 21, verse 21. And we'll pick that up there. Uh, so let me just read, uh, get the story here. So uh, Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son, Esau or not. So he's suspicious of things here, Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And this should be understood almost like a, like a subtitle. The blessing's going to come. And then, and then here's the, so here's the blessing. Then he said, are you really my son es Esau? And he said, I am. He said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game. So my soul may bless you. So he brought it, this game, near to him. And he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled, uh, and he smelled the smell of his clothing. And he blessed him and said, so, he, so, so Jacob, remember, is in these priestly garments. And, and the smell enters in here. Kind of amazing. Oh, brother. Now we got another guy here don't click on the link in the thing i wonder how this happens i don't know let me just boot this guy report to zoom remove uh just uh let me just right here don't if you go if you see a link in the chat by the way um don't if it's not from me or pastor nauman or someone that you know um don't click. There's no way, I don't know how to stop that from happening, by the way. I, I don't know how to remove it or anything like this. So if any, uh, if any of you guys are Zoom geniuses, then that's, that's great. Okay. Sorry for the distraction there. So, he, so remember, Isaac can't see very well. And so, he, um, uh, so he's relying on what? On the hearing, on the touch, and on the, uh, on the smell. This is often noted to me when, when people are, um, if people are blind or if they're deaf, their other senses sort of come in to fill in the gaps. And so Isaac is using now his smell, which I think is amazing. Now, what is the smell? The smell of the, it's like the smell of the field. And the question is, uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting. That I, I used to think, well, he just, he smells sort of rough, like he just got back from hunting. Uh, Luther's going to talk about the garments that he, that, that Isaac recognizes the smell of the priestly garments from Abraham and that he himself would wear. And now he's passing on. We'll get to that in a little bit. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let the people serve you and the nations and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. So, so the moment has arrived and whap, the blessing is given from Isaac to Jacob instead of Esau, who Jacob intended to give it to. Kind of really amazing. Now, Luther, we were reading how Luther um, says that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's where we were last week, remember? Uh, when, this, when the heart takes hold of the word, then the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit follows the power and might to do amazing things. 
the Holy Spirit has come along and um, and caused Isaac to mistakenly do something right. <laughs> so so remember the point is that that the blessing was supposed to go to Jacob. Isaac wanted to give it to Esau. Uh, Rebecca and Jacob plotted, according to the word of God, the older will serve the younger, to get Isaac to do the right thing. So he's tricked into doing a good work. And so the, um, so the thing happens here that the Lord is able to give the blessing to the right one, Jacob, in spite of Isaac's kind of unwillingness to listen to the word of God. Now, Luther talked about, and I think this is kind of funny. He talked about how the Holy Spirit has, has caused all this stuff. But then he comes along, he's reading, and maybe this was a lecture break. Remember, these were um, Luther's works here. Is He's not writing this down. Luther's not at his typewriter typing out his Genesis commentary. He's lecturing. And the students are taking notes, and then they're compiling the notes and publishing the notes under Luther's supervision, by the way. Um, I think it, at some point in Genesis, they're published after Luther dies, because remember, we're late in the life of Luther here. But I think we're still probably under his supervision in chapter 27. I, I can't remember. So, so the, a lot of times... <laughs> Like you'll get something like this where Luther says, it could have been a different way, or we might look at it this way, or it seems like he has a change of direction. What probably happened is that he finished the lecture here. It seems like a natural break to finish the lecture. And then he comes back either the next day or the next week, and he's been talking with his students about it. And some of them said, are you sure it was the Holy Spirit that caused Isaac not to be able to see? Couldn't it have just have happened? And he says, well, yeah, I suppose it could have. And so he comes back and he says, well, it also could have happened naturally. <laughs> okay. Okay. It also could have happened naturally and in a normal way that although he heard the voice, excessive eagerness and determination to give the blessing prevented him from recognizing his son. So Isaac is just very excited. It's you, you, you've seen, I've seen this before in when like, dads are ordaining their sons as pastors. You have a dad who's a pastor, his son's becoming a pastor. And that there's that kind of enthusiasm. Imagine that times a hundred, because it's not like there was a bunch of Isaacs and a bunch of Jacobs running around. There was one Abraham and the, uh, and the promise was the seed of Abraham. And that goes to Isaac. And that promise, that seed promise, that messianic line is now going to go to what well, Isaac thinks Esau, the Lord's making it Jacob. So, so Isaac is now seeing that promise that was given to Abraham and given to him now being passed, passed down. So there's a, there's a lot happening here. Okay. Uh, his determination to give the blessing prevented him from recognizing his son. A person who's intent on one thing does not concern himself about other matters, even though he sees them and grasps them with his senses. There's this, that's, this is the monomaniacal kind of thing. You become honed in on one thing. This is want to happen not only spiritually, but also physically, as can be seen in the case of people who have melancholia, melancholy. Now, this is very interesting to me. I did a, I, I was reading something the other day uh, and it was talking about how we are so quick to make everything, um, to make everything uh, diagnosable or um, psychological, or so, so that we now when we have when we have a kind of an oppressive sadness or an oppressive um, listlessness. We call it depression. And you say, I have been diagnosed with depression. But it's not like that's a new thing in the world. And here we see Luther talking about the old way that they would talk about it, which is melancholy. And so just, to, and I've been reflecting on this some, the difference between saying, I've been diagnosed with depression versus saying, I've been afflicted with melancholy. 
And because if you say, well, I've been diagnosed with depression, what good is that going to do? I mean, like the, the, the whole idea of that is crushing. What good can come out of depression? It's such a sterile name, you know, like I'm driving down the road and it dips and there's a depression, you know, or the, it's an economic word. We're, we're going from a recession to a depression or whatever. But melancholy, it's like a term of art. If you say, well, what good comes from melancholy? The answer is like every single book that you see on my shelf behind me came out of someone who had melancholy. You just can't. This is, this is just all this stuff in the ancient world, all these, the wrestling with these things. I found a picture, an Albrecht Durer woodcut called Melancholy. So you see Melancholia here, this little bat thing. Can you guys see that okay? There's Melancholy. And then here's, the, here's Lady Melancholy. She's like, a, it's like an angel. She has wings there. And here's the muse, the little baby sitting there on the, on the, on the grindstone. I, I think that's the, the kind of nose to the grindstone picture. But then look at melancholy. She's got her keys there. She's got her purse. She's got all these instruments, a saw, uh, a plane, a measuring stick, like a compass with the nails. How, where do I? I got to get my, my little spotlighter. Can you guys see that okay? <clears throat> yeah. So you, uh, now this dog is asleep. So look at that. You got this, this unfinished orb here. And then you have this stone with the hammer and the chisel. And it's like, so here's Melanka and she's got her compass. And she's just looking off into the distance at nothing. And, and so there's all this work to be done. You know, the stone is to be carved. There's some ore kind of burning in the background. Here's time is just passing by. And someone's got to ring the bell to kind of snap, snap her out of it. Here's the calendar. All the days are mixed together. I, I don't know the, I don't understand this, the calendar, but I, I, it seems to me like there's a, the, like the days all sort of run together when you have this. But the point is of, of Lady Melancholy here is that there's even, I think, the, the, the ladder to the roof. Well, there's a rainbow there. The ladder to the roof maybe has to do with astrology or something. I mean, astronomy, looking at the stars. <laughs> Becky says she needs to feed the dog. That's, pro that's probably it. There's this. So you, now, so you, you uh, many of you, Many, I suppose, of us could know that feeling right there, right? That, that melancholy right there. And yet it's surrounded by all of this uh, creativity so that it's, it's just a very, it's a very different thing, melancholy versus, versus depression. So, so Luther's talking about it here, and he says... Um, let me get my spotlighter here. It says people who have melancholy that you get sort of, you miss your, your senses, your inner, whatever. It's, it's like disconnected from the things that are happening around you. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of amazing to, to think of here. It says uh, others are talking, drinking, entering, or leaving. They neither hear nor see anything for the thoughts of uh, the heart have been diverted from their senses. The thoughts of the heart diverted from the senses. There's this fuzz between what's happening around me and what's happening inside of me. So you, th this can happen, you, you know, if you're tired, you, uh, someone, you're talking to someone and they're just staring off into space. It can happen when you're hungry. It can happen when you're distracted. Melancholy here. Uh, Therefore, when a melancholy heart is occupied with thoughts of other matters, it pays no attention to what is clearly presented to the senses. Such a person is present when others converse and tell stories and tales, yet he hears nothing of this. Indeed, the heart wanders, as it were. Uh, 
But when eating and drinking, a person who has melancholy does not know what he is eating or what he is drinking, whether it is beer or wine. So just going through the motions. That's I, I've heard people talk about that. In fact, recently, especially. Uh, I, I've probably had, well, anyway, no matter, uh, just a handful of folks who said, said a uh, pastor just feels like I'm just going through the motions. There's no life in it. That's, that's this, this sense here. Uh, so, uh, so what, you know, so what does this mean? I mean, so number one, we should remember that it's not like this is a new phenomenon in humanity. Like we now, the evolved, the 21st century people or whatever, we have, um, we have now achieved depression. The ancient world didn't have it. No, it was always there. In fact, the, the, probably Luther and all these guys back there in the ancient world thought that this was a mixing of the different humors. You know, you had these four humors that were there and, and that was the best medicine at the time. And they, they said it was um, that that was the problem. It's, it's, it's wrong, but it's probably not as foolish as we think it is. Anyway, back to Luther. Uh, when a Melikon is such a person is present when others converse, you just don't even notice it. Uh, when eating and drinking, a person who has melancholia does not know what he is eating or drinking, whether it's beer or wine. They say about Bernard, he drank oil instead of wine when he was engaged in earnest meditation. This happens far more frequently when spiritual confusion is added and a spiritual heart is wholly intent on spiritual matters. We get caught up. This is Luther himself was, was like this. We must imagine the same thing uh, happened to Isaac, who hears and recognizes Jacob's voice and does not conceal this. For he says, the voice is Jacob's, the voice is Jacob's. Nevertheless, he's torn in another direction because that one thought occupies his mind, how he wants to bless his firstborn. At the same time, he considers how important a matter this blessing is and puts together all the promises that were made to Abraham. Therefore, Isaac is occupied not only with natural thoughts, as lovers and people with melancholia usually are, but also with thoughts that are spiritual. Moreover, even before this, Rebecca depec depicted in him melancholia of this kind. Here's This is Luther filling in the backstory. Rebecca, as uh, Isaac's wife, would have recognized this. It often happened that her husband was unaware of what was going on when she placed food before him. So, so did, <clears throat> do we know of this from the text? No, Luther's building it out from the plan here. So, so Luther's saying, Rebecca must have picked up on something that she thought this plan would work. F finally, Isaac was fully convinced that the mother, together with her son, neither could nor have wanted to deceive him. Therefore, he says, the voice is indeed the voice of Jacob. Yet he abandons the thought and becomes engrossed in spiritual thoughts. The Jews are wrong when they imagine that although Isaac was aware of this and detected the fraud, he pretended not to know, for they have no knowledge of the powers of the spirit, which are stronger than melancholy thoughts. When a person's heart is occupied with these, they render him altogether senseless and ecstatic. So he blessed him. So Luther says, could have been natural causes. He just could have got focused on the blessing, but the spirit is involved. So he's back to that. The blessing does not begin as yet, for the text goes on to state that Isaac asked, are you really my son Esau? So back to, back to here, and noting, um, no, just noting what we noted before, is that, uh, is that it says, so he blessed him, but then the conversation goes on before he blesses him down here. So he blessed, he says he blessed him in verse 23, but the blessing doesn't come until verse 28. And so this is like a subhead that's going to then <clears throat> uh, that's going to tell of the blessing. Uh, he says, Moses, the text goes on and states that Isaac asked, are you really my son Esau? But Moses means that when Isaac had touched and felt Jacob's hand, he was taken completely by surprise, dumbfounded, out of his mind. And that with regard to this blessing, he concluded and affirmed in his heart that it should be unalterable and permanent as though he were saying the blessing has now been given and is definite this is later he'll say to esau 
he shall be blessed for the Holy Spirit who blesses through Isaac. This is the, it is the Holy Spirit who blesses through Isaac. One may not revoke or change anything. This was an extraordinary impulse, an operation of the Holy Spirit. On this account, he concluded within himself, after he had felt the hands and the neck, that he wanted to bless his son. Nor did he change his decision, even though many arguments were advanced against it. This is what Moses means by the preface, so he blessed him. In other words, this is the blessing that's going to follow. But here is Isaac's uh, conviction, determination to bless this man in front of him. Uh, this is what Moses means by the preface, etc. The blessing predetermined for Jacob is now unalterable and confirmed. After this, whoever desires it will be disappointed in his hope. For the Holy Spirit does not revoke his operations, as Malachi says, is not one who changes. I, the Lord, do not change. God is not man that he should lie, or son of man that he should repent. When God has rendered a verdict, he does not change or retract it as men are wont to do. Thus here, the Holy Spirit touched Isaac's heart and said in his heart, I am now blessing. The gifts of call of God are irrevocable. So he blessed him. That is, it had happened. So the text, are you really Esau, my son? I am, says Jacob lying. Then he said, bring it to me that I may eat my son's game and bless you. So he brought it to him and he ate. This is the goat prepared by Jacob and Rebekah. And he ate and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his garment and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field, which the Lord has blessed. The soul of the spirit or the life of man. Let me try that again. The soul is the spirit or the life of man in the external senses. Now, this is a really, uh, if you were looking for a definition of the soul, here you have one. I don't think this is like a definitive definition, but here you have a way of talking about the soul, and it's quite amazing. The soul sees, hears, speaks, weeps, and laughs so that I don't know how to kind of capture this idea here, but I, I like to think about these things. Um, so you have, uh, let me give myself a little bigger whiteboard here. You have in, uh, so we have our, we have our sort of external, we have our bodies, which this looks like a chalk, like at a murder scene or something. But then we have our, so you have the external body, but then you have the sort of life of the inside, the heart, the mind, the, the internal life that's there. And, 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 but then you have these connections between the two. So you've got your eyes that see and your mouth that speaks and your hands that feel and your nose that's, that smells. And, uh, and, and there's a way that this connect, there's this connection to the, from the outside stuff, zoom, 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 to the inside stuff. Now the eating is, it, it, the, the soul doesn't eat, but the soul tastes. This is the, the, the seeing and the hearing and the speaking. And so that, so that what is out can come in and then also what is inside the heart can go out. That's, that's our speaking and our doing. But, that, but especially that speaking, this is the, the, the operations of the, of the soul sort of manifesting themselves. So, um, so there's this... Th this uh, th there's this connection between the inner and the outer. And this it's it, Luther is saying that, that it's that connection, that, that sort of interface of the inner life. Here's the, here's the life that's on the inside, all the stuff that you're feeling and thinking. And then there's that, here's all the things that are happening on the outside. And the soul is that, that interface between the inner life and the outer life. It's kind of a wild thing to think about. Like why, for example, when I, 
when I, how do I, how do I go from thinking something to saying it? Or how do I go from looking at a word to processing what that word means on a page, you know, or how do I go from tasting something to it's just that, that interface between the inner life and the outer life. And Luther says, you know what that is? That's the soul. Now there's this old uh, idea from Luther that says, and, and this is a kind of an amazing one. I think we've talked about this before where, where he does the comparison of the, of the, temple with the life of man and so uh you know here's this old question are we are we body and soul or are we body soul and spirit and the answer is the bible speaks in both ways which is kind of nice and so we can speak in both ways, and I think in, this is this is how Luther does it. We remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament. There was the outer court that Moses built, and then inside the outer court was the tabernacle, and that tabernacle had two rooms in it. So that in that tabernacle there was the holy place, and then inside that was the holy of holies and so uh and so uh, luther says that the outer court is like the body and the tabernacle is like the soul and the holy of holies is the spirit and so the spirit is part of the soul but this is the this is the part of the of us the soul that affects the body so that interaction, especially between the soul and the body, what we were talking about earlier is here, but the spirit is what is connected to uh, God and his word. And so for the unbeliever, that spirit is uh, empty. It's dark. There's nothing there. It's just... Um, the, the lights are off. So the unbeliever has a spirit, but it's a dead spirit. It's an empty room. But for the Christian, the Holy Spirit comes and fills our hearts. And now that light from the Lord and his word radiates out to the soul and then to the body. Now, important, and we can't miss this. This is going to be the key thing, and this is going to come up later. How does the Holy Spirit enter in? Not from heaven, not just directly down into the soul, but through the body, especially through the ears. Faith comes by hearing, and the ear, then to the soul, then to the spirit. So like the high priest who comes in with the blood, so the Holy Spirit. Becky says, I didn't mention the heart. I think that this, we should just simply understand the heart as the soul. This is the the Old Testament way of speaking of the soul is the heart, or what we just can call, probably call the inner life that we have. So that's all happening in the heart. And so the heart is thinking, uh, feeling, remembering, and acting. Uh, those are the actions of the heart. So, uh, so anyway. This is some anthropology stuff. I, I do not know. I was thinking about this. Um, the how, like what people think of all of these things now. Like, I, I think that the, the problem is that, that now people don't see a distinct, we are just body and even the acts of the heart, the thinking, the feeling, all of these are not acts of the soul or the spirit, but rather just mechanical acts of the mind, as if we are chemical, like just sort of these grand chemical things, and all these things are deterministic illusions. Ugh. Okay. Uh, let's see. I will bless you with my soul. This reason ceremony is added. 
So I, so Isaac decides to bless Jacob. I will bless you. But then he's going to add the ceremonies. And then Luther says, even spiritual things that are external cannot be administered without external ceremonies. So that remember how we, the, the Holy Spirit gets to the, gets to the heart, gets to the spirit, not by parachuting in from above, but through the body. So the body is how we receive spiritual blessings. Luther says, that's it. The five senses in the entire body of their own gestures and rites under which the body must live as if under certain masks. Therefore, Isaac blessed not only in his heart, but also with the external senses and ceremonies. Sons who were to be blessed had to bring their father some rather delicious food and wine. After this, they approached and kissed their father. These are really civil ceremonies. And today they are retained among kings and princes when fiefs are bestowed. We also observe them in the schools when we create doctors of theology. Uh, it's a weird thing. When you, are, when you become a doctor of theology, you go and you, they put a hood on you. What the heck? Like, wh why? Why? Wh why do you need something like that? Well, it's cool. <laughs> but it's because we're not just, we're not pure spirit. We're not, every, the, the, everything good comes to us from the body. So it's good that we observe these external things. The, after the ceremony is observed, Moses says again, and he blessed him externally when he'd smelled the fragrance of his garments. For a sense which moves the Holy Spirit is always present. And the Holy Spirit moves hearts through external things. This is the, this is the key that sets apart. Uh, well, th this is what distinguishes Protestantism from the other forms of Christianity, is they want the Holy Spirit to be working only in the heart. Uh, this is, I'm excluding Lutherans from Protestants, but this, is, this might be the thing that sets Lutherans apart from everybody. This emphasis on the external word. As for example, through the word, through the ceremonies and objects which move the heart through an external sense. After these operations, the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit, Isaac takes courage, and he now, as if in a trance, is entirely convinced that this is his firstborn son. He's made confident by the fragrance of the garments. These were the priestly robes of Abraham and Isaac, which they preserved with the utmost care by applying cassia and other fragrant substances, lest they be nibbled at by the moths. Thus, today we make use of nard and the like. Consequently, Isaac thought, this is Esau, my firstborn son, for he's clothed in the priestly robes. Thus he was deceived in the spirit, and now he is deceived by a sense. Now, this is very interesting to me because I always thought the smell there, the smell of the field, but, but Luther's, he's got this picture in his mind that this is this, the high priestly garments that were first fashioned. Well, maybe they were given by, from, they were passed down from Noah to Shem, um, Melchizedek, Abraham, or maybe they were just Abraham's own robes, but I look, they're robes also of Isaac. So Isaac recognizes that, that who he thinks is Esau, Jacob is wearing his, his ordination robes. I, I have a, there's something, there's something here. Now, if you want to say, no, no, this is Luther's totally off the mark. Okay, you can. There's no problem to say that, but I think there might be something here. I know that um, I wore. Uh, we had confirmation a couple of weeks ago, so we got to wear red. We have Pentecost coming up on Sunday, so it'll be red again in church. And the stole, the one stole that I have, that's from Carrie, is my. It was my red ordination stole, and every time I put it on, I, I remember that. I remember my ordination. All the other stoles I have are, well, one I inherited and it's special to me. The other, they, they belong to the church. All the stoles are, are beautiful and wonderful to put on this light yoke of Christ. But that ordination stole is, is different. So that's the idea here is that, is that there's these special robes that are there. That he employs a fine comparison. The smell of my son is as the smell of the field, which the Lord has blessed. So Luther understands this not to say the, you smell like the dirt, but rather you smell wonderful like the field blessed by the Lord smells. 
So it's an analogy for the farmer knows well what the smell of the field is like when the harvest approaches, how delightful the smell is. In like manner, the smell of vineyards is very pleasing, completely invigorating when the vintage season approaches. Accordingly, Isaac congratulates himself and gladdens his heart because of the blessing to be pronounced on his son. He thinks, now I have an heir and a successor with whom I am pleased and delighted, just as if he were walking on a field or some fragrant vineyard when the smell and fragrance would refresh the whole body and soul. So he smells the garments and he's like, you, um, what is it in Psalm four? You have made, you have given me more joy than in the time when the grain and wine increased. The, there's the joy of, it's like when you go into church on Christmas Eve and all the smells are there. Now I shall die gladly and in peace for I leave behind me a Lord and teacher of my house, a father of the future generation and a priest. Thus, Moses describes Isaac in an intoxicated with joy and drunk, as it were, with the best and happiest thoughts about his son and successor. He drinks wine and is of good cheer. He's intoxicated, if it may be so, more with the Holy Spirit and spiritual thoughts. For his one and chief comfort, this is Isaac the Christian, is the knowledge that he has an heir of that blessing which was to be looked for through Christ, the promise of the seed. And he undoubtedly added the fact that the promise given to Abraham was now in effect and was being extended to the third heir. Abraham to Isaac to now. I mean, Isaac thinks it's Esau, but it's Jacob. So the third heir of this promise. This blessing was far different, much more sublime than the consecrated water concerning which the papists make many false assertions. Luther's now going to go into a tirade of the kind of false blessings um, that happen. And he's going to talk about the difference between a wish and a blessing. So look at this. When Christ sends his disciples to teach the gospel, he says to them, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. Likewise, eat what is set before you. For the Lord gives physical blessings, bread and wine, since this life cannot do without these physical blessings. The gospel is the chief blessing, but the other things are added for those who seek the kingdom of heaven. The first blessing deals with eternal life. The second is physical. Now, understand first here, uh, th this should be probably uh, translated chief. The chief blessing, it's not the one that comes first, because the one that comes first is going to be the earthly blessing that has to do with the home. And then the second blessing is the, is, the, is the national blessing, which has to do with the state. And then Luther sees here in your mother's sons bowing down, he sees this as a blessing of the priesthood. So home, family, state, priesthood, the three estates are there. Therefore, don't be, as Jesus says, Matthew 6, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Your heavenly father knows that you need them all. We shall see Isaac add this external blessing to the blessing of eternal life, which one cannot have without the physical blessing. So the Lord first, uh, well, we first seek the Lord's righteousness. The Lord first gives us a bit of bread to eat. How are we doing? Oh, okay. I, gotta, I, want, I want to move a little bit fast. If you guys have questions, please put them in the chat or let me know what you're thinking about. But I want to get through a couple of pages here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move it a little bit. So here comes the blessing from Isaac. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let the people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers as you're uh, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. Blessed be everyone who blesses you. This is the form of the blessing. The first part pertains to the sustenance of the body. For without this, we cannot live even in the kingdom of God, so far as the life is concerned. For the body must be nourished if we must teach and govern the church. You have to eat so that you can walk, so that you can teach. Accordingly, the first part pertains to the management of the household and to the household supplies in order that wife, children, domestics may have the necessities of daily life. This is the estate of the home. And we're going to see again, just as we're noticing Luther's pattern of thought, that it all comes back to the three estates, home, state, church. First, home. The Lord's Prayer, we call this daily bread, everything that's needed in the house for the sustenance of the body. 
Okay. Um, we have this because the Lord blesses it. Jacob is sure of sustenance in the household for himself and his descendants, and that sustenance will not be meager. It'll be sumptuous and luxurious. No one can, as, oh, sorry, as one can see surely in the book of Kings, how the promise was fulfilled. The godly should acknowledge that they have their earthly things because God gives and blesses. They should not dream as the heathen and the unbeliever do that either the good or the evil things in this life come about by chance. We, th th this, is not, this life is not a roll of the dice. On the contrary, they acknowledge that these great gifts come from God. They should be grateful to God for the benefits. As the apostles declare, he did good and gave us from heaven rains and fruitful seasons, satisfying our hearts with gladness. The second part of the blessing has to do with the state. So here we're going to look at, uh, here, let the people serve you and the nations bow down to you. So here's the first part of the blessing, home. Here's the second part of the blessing, state. Has to do with the state and pertains to authority. Jacob has a, is appointed Lord over peoples and nations. Peoples and nations see it there his descendants will be princes and kings not only heads of household people will serve him etc etc and then comes the third part which is this right here it has to do with the house so this is the third part is spiritual and pertains to the priesthood the brothers born of the same father and the same mother will bow down to you Perhaps they can enjoy the same authority in the state and in the household, but you alone will get the priestly authority. Now, I'll admit to you that here again, this is, this is not what I, when I read this thing and I pick up on. So this is one of the advantages of letting Luther sort of fill in the story. I think he has a good case, but he's going to have to make that case. Uh, but here it comes. He, I mean, one of the reasons why he, uh, he's understanding it this way is that um, he sees this all in line with the promise of the seed. And so what's the chief thing for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Is it that he's going to be a huge nation and have earthly power? No. The chief thing is that the Lord is going to bring the blessings in the kingdom of the Messiah. You alone will have to get the priestly authority. This is the chief part of the blessing. Earlier, he says, peoples will serve you. Tribes of the earth will bow down to you. This bowing down is a civil matter. But this here, your brothers, is something else. And it has reference to the brothers and sons of the same mother. Although it could be referred to as the state. So Luther says this could be an extension of the political promise. It is more properly understood of the third part of the blessing, since he mentioned the state earlier. He's adding something else. Okay. These then are the three hierarchies we often inculcate, namely the household, the government, and the priesthood, or the home, the state, and the church. Luther is right that he always is inculcating these. It's all the time he's finding these three estates, home, state, and church. It's just, it's just the pattern of his own thinking. Um, I, I've been collecting, um, I wonder where, uh, I, I, I want to show you that I, I just updated this. Um, I just updated this web page. I, I've got this, um, this, this post that I've got, which is the, the, thinking like a Lutheran, the three estates, and I'm just dropping quotes from Luther here about the three estates. So I'll share that in the chat if you guys want to track that down. But it's just it just runs through everything, these three estates. I just added this section that we just have here this morning um, uh, to the comment to the to the quote section there. So this this right here is what we're looking at right now. So so this is a um, it's, it's just a, it's a way of even reading and thinking about the entire world, the three estates.
And it's very helpful. Okay. If you have questions, let me know. In this manner, excellent provision has been made for Isaac's son. He's been appointed the heir. So he, together with his descendants and his own household, realm, and church. Home, nation, church. And it's a rich and magnificent blessing by which he has been established with regard to the future inheritance, which he could hope and wait for with certainty and without dispute. Now, what is this blessing? Now we're going to enter into a conversation about the blessing. And I'm looking at the time. Let me, let me see what we're going to do here. Luther wants to say that this blessing is more than just empty words or wi wishes, but they are, in fact, effective working words. This has to do with the effect with the efficacy of the word of God, with the, um, the fact that our words are descriptive, God's words are effective, and he gives us those effective words to speak. But let's leave that for next week, shall we? This is probably a good spot to stop. If I want to finish early, and I also want to talk to you guys. So let's stop there. Let's say a prayer, then I'll stop the recording, and then we'll all jump in and see what's on your mind. O oh Lord, we give you thanks that you have seen to it that the promise of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, continued through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bless us and all the world. We pray that you would give us wisdom and joy by your word and spirit, that we would always delight in you and your goodness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you his peace. Amen.